Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of MLOps Community Coffee Sessions. I'm Vishnu, and I'm here with Demetrios. How are you doing, Demetrios? What's going on? I am pretty stoked to talk to Mefta today because there is a whole line of grocery stores in Canada that I had no idea existed, and apparently they are pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on grocery stores, but I'm definitely interested in hearing more about this particular chain and how they are leveraging ML in production. Uh, Loblaws, apparently, which is omnipresent in Canada. Today, we have Mefta Sadat, a senior ML engineer at Loblaws, here to join us to tell us all about how this multi-billion dollar business uses ML in production, leverages different tooling, and share his experience and perspective on where MLOps tooling is going to go in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Mefta. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to the session. So it's a pleasure to have you here. And I want to start off by asking you first to tell us about yourself and what you do at Loblaws and what Loblaws is. Yeah, so uh, by now you probably know how big Loblaw is at Canada. Uh, we have we are one of the largest grocery store chains. There is literally uh, within ten minutes of every Canadian, there is a, one of our stores. So uh, yeah, we have uh, we have a big presence here. Um, and within Loblaw Enterprise, uh, my my company is Loblaw Digital, which is like a smaller tech uh, part of uh, Loblaw. And our main uh, focus is to build our digital experiences. We have uh, different kind of experiences, like we have our online grocery business where we sell groceries online. You could uh, order your groceries from your app or, or our website and go to our store, just stay in your car and they will deliver to your car all your groceries. And we also do deliveries. Uh, you, you could order and get your deliveries delivered to your, at your home. Uh, and there are other other side of the business. We have uh, pharmacy. We have Joe Fresh. We also have a loyalty program called PC Optimum, uh, which is one of the largest loyalty programs as well um, in Canada. So yeah. So my my team is within Lobby Digital. Uh, our group is data science, and my team is the ML and data platform team. So we basically build our um, ML platform for our data scientists to use and deploy their all their machine learning models all their experiments and also take care of all our data ingestion, data engineering, all those kind of things. Yeah. Awesome. And how did you get into ML engineering? Yeah, so um, I was I was doing my master's at Ryerson here in Toronto and my my study was mainly focused around solving computer science and software engineering problem using machine learning and I really liked uh, how this field was evolving. So uh, right after I graduated, I, I started at a startup here in Toronto and the product was great. Like they were building a television uh, experience and it's Netflix like Netflix like experience for television content. So they're building an app where your regular TV content would go and you could see it uh, like a Netflix, right? So, so your TV providers basically give you this experience. And uh, my, my job was to build out uh, a recommendation and um, a personalization experience for our users. And I, I got to do it from scratch. So it was pretty cool. Um, we had a small team, but uh, we have some good content and we ended up uh, building that application and now it's available for all the consumers. So that's kind of where I started my journey. And uh, after that, I just moved to Loblo, where I'm here uh, for uh, over three years now. Yeah. Got it. Pretty, pretty classic journey in terms of arriving to uh, the machine learning world. I feel like a lot of our listeners will empathize with starting off from a master's program, getting hands on with a particular application and, and the rest being history. I want to start by understanding what some of the sort of use cases for machine learning are at Loblaws. It sounds like Loblaws is a traditional, pretty traditional grocery chain, which I think is one of the most interesting businesses in the world when you think about all the different kinds of products that grocery stores have to have, the intense supply chain, and the really diverse consumer base. So can you tell us a little bit about how ML is applied and what kinds of things Loblaws wants to apply ML to? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are so many use cases you can think of when you are dealing with a grocery business, um, starting from, let's say, our e-commerce experience where you have your typical 
search your typical recommendation use case where you would want to show your users the best products they want to buy or the next items they want to buy. You also want to give them some personalized experience, right? Like you want to uh, predict what they're going to buy next time they go to the store, right? Or next time they order online. And there is also uh, a whole lot of other use cases at the store level where we want to optimize how our orders are getting picked up, how we batch pick our orders, starting uh, increasing efficiency. Also, there are use cases where we have to pick, uh, where we have to predict inventory. Think about uh, when you go to grocery stores, you take a product from the aisle. It's actually until you check out at the cashier. That product is not in your inventory, but we don't really know, right? Like if that is uh, minor deducted from our actual inventory numbers. So we have to predict all these things in real time. And uh, yeah, so there are so many things uh, going on at Lobdog. That is fascinating, especially that part about predicting inventory. I hadn't thought about it, but in an age of Instacart and so many other different kinds of shoppers and, and your own delivery service, it's more important than ever to know what's actually on the shelves and in stock, not to mention all the other things that you mentioned are where ML systems are applied. And so you have this like super diverse set of use cases uh, that you want to use across your business. And I'm sure that your company has a lot of data scientists and machine learning professionals that are applying forecasting or analytics to help solve these business problems. How does your ML and data platform team work with those data scientists? and to empower those data scientists. I'd love to learn more about how your team operates. Yeah, so uh, the goal of my team is to, is to make the, make the data science uh, life cycle uh, quicker. So think about starting from exploratory data analysis, building your model, validating your model to go all the way to production. This is a very complicated process, right? And we want to make this process as smooth and as easy as possible and as fast as possible as well. So uh, we build a lot of different tooling. We build a lot of example projects for data scientists. We, we collaborate with data scientists on, on individual projects. Uh, like we pair up with them, go over kind of system, doing system design with them and uh, kind of highlighting all the best practices or like uh, different tools that they could use to solve a given problem, yeah. Got it. How many people are on your team and how many people are users of your platform? Yeah, so uh, we, we, have, um, we have around six to 10 people in my team. Um, we, have, we have engineers, we have our team lead, and then we have project manager and some, some folks from SRE uh, who will help us like, um, like maintain uh, in production systems in production. And um, we also have a lot of data science teams uh, working with us. We have more than 60 people within our group. So there are quite a few data science teams that we have to interact on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they're like what data science teams are divided across different business functions, for example, like forecasting or let's say search or personalization. So there are different, different groups within the data science division. And all of us kind of work together and in our platform, uh, we, we host different services uh, built by these teams. Yeah. Got I'm it. interested in that uh, and how you go about deciding what you're going to work on. And this comes up because I was just reading a pretty awesome article from Eugene Yan about technical design docs, I think. And, and then I put it in the MLOps community and and Laszlo commented and said, oh, yeah, well, these are just like PRDs. And I was thinking about it, and I was wondering if people have specific things that they do for PRDs when it is ML-related. And if there's anything that when you're trying to figure out what you're going to work on next, do you specifically call out or do you have processes that are different than say a normal DevOps or software engineering process? Yeah, so um, I think we have two kind of approaches. One approach we have, we set up a lot of example designs or projects like with the whole life cycle. So um, you could start with them. So we, we, we use a lot of template projects, for example. Um, so a template project is just something you could just 
flown into a repo and then you have the whole, whole uh, pipeline starting from building, training, testing your pipeline, running load tests and deploying your pipeline. So that kind of have, a, it, has, it has a specific design and um, deployment uh, architecture. So you could start with that. The other one is we kind of could uh, get together and collaborate work on different aspect of the design. And normally data scientists, um, they sometimes take input from software engineers because our uh, email platform team is mostly uh, built with software engineers and email engineers. So we kind of collaborate and give some of our insights on how, let's say, would design go. Um, if there is any anything that, that we can do better, we just give our thoughts on that, yeah. Got it. So. I noticed that you mentioned that your team is not just the ML platform team, but ML and data platform team. Can you talk to me about what constitutes the data platform and what differentiates it from the ML platform? Yeah, so um, so we we started building our data platform first and then onto our ML platform because, as you know, without data, we cannot really do ML, right? So um, uh, we our data platform uh, comprises of different things, like we have um, we have in, in input data coming through our streaming Kafka pipelines. Uh, we have, uh, for example, like data coming from point of cell devices or data coming from our inventory. Those data are coming into um, into our into our streaming systems. We also have some uh, data coming as feeds. So all these data they go into our data warehouse. We have BigQuery as our data warehouse, where which is kind of the unified place where all our data lives, right? So BigQuery is a very powerful tool uh, for like analytics or uh, like if you, if you ever run a query on BigQuery, you'd know how fast it is to run your uh, queries there. So yeah, so all of these um, data pipelines uh, we kind of orchestrate uh, using um, different tools like, for example, like Apache Airflow is one of the tools we use. And we also use Kafka PubSub uh, heavily to build out this platform. So, so we have we have our data warehouse. We also have some streaming topics that we expose for other teams to consume using PubSub or Kafka. And yeah, so basically, once we have the data, our use cases mainly uh, just in, in, use this data from our data warehouse and build stuff. Yeah, fascinating. This is it's interesting to see the 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 sort of overlap between the data professional, sort of traditional data professional and you and then your team and the sort of ML professional. Because I think a lot of times what happens in a lot of organizations is you have one or the other, you know, where, you know, you'll have an, an, an organization that gets excited about, you know, machine learning and maybe hires like a data scientist or a machine learning professional and says, okay, go do machine learning. Or you have a very traditional analytics stack or analytics focused organization that then over time maybe starts to say, Let's let's add machine learning, but the root is in in this sort of analytical focus, right? And it's driven by that. I'm curious from your standpoint, how did this all evolve? You know, at, at Loblaws in terms of what was the timeline for starting to really leverage machine learning in your products um, and in your business? Yeah. So when I started, um, we were a very small team compared to where where we are now. We are at now. At that time, our focus was just to build out our data platform first and start with a very simple set of ML use cases. So we already had a legacy recommendation system. We had some legacy uh, other ML projects. So we kind of take those uh, projects and modernize them using cloud. So they were running in our uh, in our Hadoop cluster in our data center at the beginning. But once we started to move to cloud, we first uh, make make effort to build our data warehouse and then kind of take these this legacy projects and build out uh, our our first cloud ML projects. And once we get gain more experience on that, and we we kind of um, showed the business that we could deliver ML ML products and impact. We can create a very good impact on on our uh, business. Then they started to buy in, right? And once once we iterate over this design over and over, we, we gain the capability to ship ML models much faster and much quicker. Before it could take like six months to put an ML system into production, but now it will be like two to three months just because we have everything in place. So yeah, so you could see, like, one example I could give you is like a simple uh, labor forecasting model could give you a lot of efficiency, right? So you could you could see, see the matrix and the numbers and you you see how much money you could save or how much 
uh, time you could save, right? So those those impacts were very important for us. Yeah. I want to know what did it look like when you made that transition from these legacy systems to the cloud, and what are some top or key things that you would like to let everyone else know who may or may not have to go through that? What are some gotcha moments that you might've had or anything along those lines? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I, I can tell you is with the, with the legacy, um, legacy data center approach, we had a huge Spark cluster and the people who were working at that time were given all the resource all the time, right? Because the cluster was up all the time. So, so when they were writing applications, they were not thinking about efficiency in terms of cost or resource allocation, right? But with cloud, you could create resources on demand. Like you could spin up a Kubernetes cluster, or you could spin up a Dataproc uh, Spark cluster and shut it down once you are done. So uh, you could scale up for like, uh, 30 minutes, do your things quickly, and then shut, shut it down. So when you think about scale and um, on-demand resource allocation, those kind of things you have to um, you have to use, um, you, have to, you can cloud, cloud, you use cloud very efficiently. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, just think about, um, think about how you're going to be transitioning, like use tools that are easily adaptable to cloud. For example, you're using HBase. And in Google Cloud, we produce Bigtable. So we, we, there is a very easy transition, right? So for that, for Spark, it was uh, just to data proc. So those are very easy transitions. Uh, yeah. I really want to dive deep into this whole use case here because the recommendation systems use case, it's, I've never really worked on recommendation systems, but it seems like it's, well, it is the field in which I think there has been the most sort of production ML work that's that's happened, right? Um, even more so than I think deep learning systems like recommendation systems are everywhere, right? It's the most profitable business model in the world than Google. <laughs> so you leveraged cloud tooling, as you mentioned, right? The shift from going from sort of an on-prem legacy stack to using an on-prem, oh, sorry, a cloud stack for your recommendation system. Can you talk to me in a little bit more detail about what the actual use case was that you were architecting this recommendation system around, what tools you're using for it now, and sort of what the impact has been on the business? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so this recommendation system was about um, showing the users um, their most um, purchased items or the next next basket kind of uh, use case. So, so this legacy stuff, the stack was using MapReduce, it was using HBase, and it was all, everything was uh, based on our data center. But when we moved to cloud, uh, there are several things we wanted to do better. One of them was performance of this uh, system. So this legacy system was taking a long time just running um, the MapReduce algorithm and loading the data. Like it was a batch prediction system, so it would it would run the algorithm, it would create recommendation, and then load all the data to HBase. Uh, but when we moved to cloud, uh, we wanted to improve the performance of the system. So let's say it was taking uh, one second to get return a recommendation. We wanted to bring it down to less than hundred milliseconds, which was which was a very big drop and a great improvement in our customer experience. So. Um, what what we did was we used Bigtable and we also deployed this system into Kubernetes. Uh, so we we um, we have our other backend teams. Uh, they are running in Kubernetes as a microservice architecture. So once we have uh, we have we have our own recommendation microservice, they could easily easily call them microservice instead of just getting the recommendation from the database directly. So that led to a couple of things. So more and more teams could use recommendations because now we offer recommendation as a service. Uh, so that shift uh, to the architecture was was really great. And then um, then also the performance. So now that we are using Cloud Bigtable, which is Google's uh, NoSQL kind of database offering, and it has very high uh, performance and throughput. So, so just by using uh, Bigtable as a as a offline storage for a recommendation, uh, sorry, an online storage for a recommendation could uh, could improve our free, uh, our, our latency, 
by a great deal. So that kind of bring down our target to less than 100, 100 millisecond. And we are also using Cloud Composer, which is which is the orchestration cloud. And with Cloud Composer, we are able to run this pipeline on a schedule, see when it fails. We had we can we could retry our pipelines. We could have alerting or set up on the pipeline. Let's say one time it fails, it would just directly email us so your pipeline fails. So this overall kind of observability gives <clears throat> makes our pipeline more resilient. So so that was another another uh, upgrade. And um, we also have different type of monitoring setup. Like we had, we were monitoring our um, our microservice through a through a tool called App Dynamics. So that would also give us um, real time uh, monitoring metrics like latency, throughput, um, and we also have alerting. Right. So so those kind of observability tooling uh, made our services much more resilient. We knew when stuff was going wrong, we could proactive get proactive and fix it. So yeah. That's really this is really interesting actually because this is this is a large scale enterprise sort of offering of ML right internally of course but I can imagine now that you've exposed this microservice as you said a lot more people can consume it it's much more performant it is you know it's a better engineered system but along the way is I have to imagine that there were a lot of bumps and that there were a lot of growing pains as you staffed up to add more experience to your team as you figured out, you know, the challenges with different tools, because I know that, you know, as cool as Bigtable and Cloud Composer and stuff are that, you know, sometimes that there are a lot of different quirks and, and pain points in the process of adopting new tools and getting them right for your use case. Can you talk yeah. to me about how long this whole project took and what some of the biggest challenges you faced were? Yeah, so, so this is, this was one of the earliest projects that we did. And we, we faced a lot of problems in terms of um, permissions, like how you do set different type of identity for your app. You need to grant permissions in cloud for different things. So there are kind of toil around that. So you want a specific app to have specific permissions, for example, like read access to your database or, or cloud storage or something. Uh, so there is a lot of toil around that. There was a steep learning curve for a data scientists for Airflow and Cloud Composer because, as you know, it's not very user friendly to some extent. Uh, there are like um, some issues you often see, and any, any long term users of Apache Airflow, they will tell you uh, there are some 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 reading around uh, around the tools. So, so there was a steep learning curve around that, and um, overall, like. Uh, cloud tooling, there are, there are some learning curves as well for data scientists. So with with all these things, we kind of uh, started to started to shift our focus to, towards building a reusable platform. So so now we have we have used all these tools, we have deployed a service, but how can we do better? So we 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 used with a few new tools and um, we incorporated them into our platform. For example, one of these tools are Seldon Core. So Seldon Core is our model serving tool that we're using right now. So pre previously, like I was saying, like we are using our custom microservice as an architecture. Uh, now we are using Seldon as a model serving architecture. So, so Seldon, after being in Seldon, like anything you build, you have to build uh, now with Seldon. So, so once you know Seldon, it's much getting much much easier to serve your model. And the next step was just creating those examples, those reusable libraries, those template projects, and set up everything um, using this these tools. And that kind of paved the way for our data scientists to uh, to start using this platform, right? So now now that we have a, a fixed set of tooling, we know what we are doing and. Um, uh, we have all the all, all of the examples and templates and reusable codes available for data scientists. They could start leveraging this platform more. So that was kind of our approach. Really, really fascinating. I think that there are a lot of listeners that are hearing what you're saying and and empathizing in terms of the same challenges or the same sort of maturity process that your team and your company went through and, and are seeing it happen or have has happened at their company. The question I have listening to what you talked about in terms of how you have coalesced around a specific tooling stack, around a process that is heavily informed by your experience working with these tools and putting in place a, a production recommendation system is how did you get 
data scientists upskilled on these tools? And did you face any pushback in terms of your choices for what tools they should use? Yeah, so this is a good point. So first, uh, when we are we were doing a lot of POC projects um, to start out different tooling. So we use um, open source tools such as Feast, for example, or MLflow uh, and Seldon Core. And then we also use some cloud tools. So when you're doing the POC with open source tools, uh, last uh, I mean this year uh, around I think mid this year Google announced Vertex AI, so which which kind of bring in, uh, opened a new door for ML uh, practice on Google, right? So with Vertex AI, you also did the POC, uh, leveraging the whole Vert Vertex AI platform to build the same thing we built using open source tooling, right? So with, with the Vertex AI, we also use uh, some of the open source, but mostly using Vertex AI uh, tooling. And once we, we have done that, we we kind of ask the data scientists, okay, so here is here is the platform. Can we, can we do a POC now with your data science project? Can we use one of your project as, a, as an example and run this on our platform using these tools? Start onboarding MLflow, for example, or start onboarding Feast in your project. And we kind of help them guide through this whole process where we give, 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 give them our uh, platform and then we onboard one of their projects, right? So after we do that, do that, we just gather feedback from data scientists, like what went well, what, where, where we could do better. So those kind of questions, those kind of discussions, those really helped us kind of decide on what to use and how to use them. Uh, for example, with MLSO, one of the feedback we we received was um, there is there is no access control in the open source version, right? So so let's say like there is no role based access control. Like everyone will use the same MLSO server. They could kind of have the same level of access. They could edit anyone's experiment. So which was one of the issues uh, we found. So so we we, we wanted fine grained access. And um, so in our case, it would be best if everyone, we can grant roles to every user, but that wasn't available uh, with open source and also version. So, so that was one of the issues that we found out. And just as we experiment with different tools and gather feedback, more and more features or um, uh, other kind of issues just come out, yeah. So actually, I was gonna ask about the access and more specifically like data access and how you dealt with that because i know you mentioned you you caught a few tough times when it came to the transition and learning and then having to upskill into the cloud so what did it look like like what were some of the ways you got around the data access problems <laughs> and if you're watching yeah. on video you can see my daughter wants to show her little baby in the screen right now. <laughs> she wants to, her doll to get a cameo appearance. Uh, but yeah, like like these data access and the, I guess also what you were talking about, the role access and being able to have like um, RBAC was very important for you. So how did you get around that? Like what did what was the solution that you ended on? Yeah, for, um, for this is the reason we kind of preferred uh, Google offerings. So Vertex AI has um, like naturally inherits all the Google uh, goodies, right? So Google has role-based access control. It gives you really fine grain access. So when you are using the Vertex ML metadata service, we could still use Google's, um, Google's um, like permission and access uh, tooling. So, so that was one of the reasons we 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 decided to go with ML metadata instead of MLflow and feature store um, instead of uh, Feast. So, so that was one of the reasons, just because we're using Google Cloud Platform and it offers that built-in. This this support is already built into the platform, and there is also data access issues, right? So, when you're talking about data, we we use a different things such as uh, policy tags in BigQuery that could uh, restrict access. For example, if you have PII data, you don't want anyone to see those data. So you could you could have PII data blocked using policy tags on Google BigQuery. And there is also like platform. Uh, there is a platform called DLT that anonymizes your that, that would anonymize unstructured data. So let's say you have user reviews or like you have a chatbot in your website where people could input free from text, right? So all those kind of data sources 
could be potential source of PII data, and you want to make sure this data is uh, secured. So there are tools such as DLP, such as DLP that you could use uh, to uh, kind of scan these kind of data sets and um, create access control on top of the state of data. That makes sense. I mean, having to do that in the open source world would have been cumbersome. And it probably would have taken you a lot longer than you could have just gone out and bought it. And so that, that uh, trade-off is always fascinating to think about and, and what you're going to optimize for and what you should be building yourself as opposed to just going out and buying. So sticking on this theme of GCP and tooling and the stack that you built, what's been your experience thus far? I know there's a lot of people out there that I almost, and I, I hate to say it, but sometimes when people come to me and they ask me, hey, how should I get started? Or we're starting to set up our ML ops initiative. What should I do? And uh, a lot of times I say, just go to the big cloud vendors and buy what they have, their offering, because it seems like it's the easiest way to get set up, but you it's not your story, but you have been using it for a while. So I want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. So, so one example um, I could give you is you have to be very careful about your cost uh, when you're using cloud, right? So things could start to go wrong pretty easily. Um, so um, you have to you have to set up like sort of monitoring on your costing practices. Uh, one example where we are using Carl to do some sort of readiness check. And it was, it was having some log message, which was a pretty bit longer than usual. And it was blowing up our costs um, just because we are logging more. And we had a logging sync set up between our um, Kubernetes and our BigQuery. And it was costing us a lot of money. So we had to immediately uh, kind of fix that. So that is one example. Uh, so let's say you, this, these tools have auto-scaling, right? So it could, it could if you do, if you're not careful for example if you're using data flow and you have auto scaling turned on and you are training a, some image um, uh, image classification model right and if you are not careful and set about auto scaling set your number of workers those kind of limits you could it could st start to auto scale very quickly and um, you could you could burn up a lot of money so there are some 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 problems around uh, not problems i would say like Considerations, you have to be very careful about costing and resource allocation, those kind of things. Um, did, yeah. you, did you set up alerts for that? Like, did you figure out a way to make sure that that doesn't happen? And yeah, is so, there a way? So, our, yeah, so our, our team, they normally have billing alerts set up at project levels for every project. This is kind of an organiz organizational thing. So we are, we are uh, aware of what's going on in, in terms of cost. Yeah. Got it. This has been a great conversation. I really feel like, you know, one of the things I appreciate when talking to people, uh, ML engineers at companies tell me about what, you know, what they've done is, is hearing how, you know, they saw a problem and were able to try different approaches and settled on something and what trade-offs they were able to make. Uh, and, and learning what technologies are most effective in different contexts, for example, hearing from you about how you use Bigtable, is always a, it's always a plus because it's something that I can kind of take back to my own work. Uh, and say, okay, this is a reference point, you know, for technology that can work in a given situation. Um, and it definitely gives me uh, a lot to think about when I'm doing my day-to-day -day work. Now, with that said, a question I want to ask you is, you know, you have had this great experience working for a few years at Loblaws, working on production, productionizing ML in a highly relevant business case. What part or problem in the process of productionizing ML are you most passionate about? And would and that you know you would like to continue developing expertise in? Yeah. So for me personally, I, I like um, I like search and recommendation space um, as a product. So so that is one thing I really enjoyed. My my master's was also I, I use recommendation technique to solve software engineering problems. And in my first company, I did a recommendation project as well. So um, I'd like to see the recommendation problem. You know, it's a, it's a it's a very talked about problem, right? But I want to see 
I want to see working on making this problem more generic. So you don't really have to build recommendation every time you have a problem. You can you could just leverage the recommendation as a service or something like that. I know some some cloud already offered that as a service. I think Amazon does one, but um, but there that that could be like uh, that could be more available. And also when we were talking about recommendation, we are only talking about the prediction part. But we need to think about how the models are performing. So we have to think about the feedback loop, how, how our recommendations are actually performing in production. So there are not a lot of tooling around, um, around post-deployment or post-building um, post your model. So how, how you do you know how the recommendations are working as, as, as you want? or what is the what is the engagement? So so there is a there is a disconnect I think between like um, like web analytics and machine learning. So I, I would want to work on bridging that gap. So between web analytics to let's say machine machine learning. Yeah, that is a really fascinating way to put it. And one thing coming out of this conversation i'm going to task you with dimitrios is that mefta has got to talk to jacopo at covio who is also thinking a lot about recommendations and recently came out with a beta version of a testing library for recommendation systems i think you'd find that really interesting mefta yeah. and to go deeper on that topic i want to know how are you guys thinking about post-deployment monitoring of your recommendation systems yeah, so so right now um, we we are like like you said we use Celdon Core for model serving, and uh, we also have a feedback loop using Celdon because Celdon supports like multi M bandit and other type type of complex inference job where we could in real time uh, use customer feedback or other type of analytics feedback to uh, tune your models like which one is uh, serving. And we also have some analytics platform with Adobe Analytics and Snowplow. So we use we leverage that data sets coming directly from our consumer applications and kind of uh, build dashboards or um, uh, graphs using the, that data and using Looker. We use Looker for, for that, that. And then in Looker, we, we could set, set less alerting. So let's say your new model isn't performing or your data is problem or a drift in your data or model performance, we would detect that from those data. So yeah, so we are, we are still um, evaluating different alternatives and uh, how we are doing uh, around uh, those practices. But uh, up to that point, our platform is very um, fixed for now, uh, yeah. Well, that is a great way, I think, to wrap up our conversation. This has been an excellent use of an hour. Thank you so much for joining us, Mefta. It is, it is always a great opportunity for, for me, and I think I'm speaking for Demetrios on this standpoint, to, oh, yeah. to speak to a great engineer you like you. <laughs> You're just gonna sign off on it. But really yep. to speak to a great engineer like you, somebody that really thinks deeply about you know, what kinds of trade-offs to make, has expertise in tools, and, and really cares about impact and use case. So thank you so much for joining us, sharing your wisdom, and, and letting us know that Loblaws is within 10 minutes of every Canadian. <laughs> Blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, Loblaws thank you so is much. a force to be reckoned with in Canada. And I got to give a shout out. People that are listening do not realize, but you have a guitar in the background. So as a fellow guitar player, it's awesome to see. And I really appreciate you being very transparent and candid with us about everything that you've gone through in your journey at Loblaws to create a better ML system and the whole ML ops process that's around that. Thanks a lot. And for everyone listening, still give us a like, give us a thumbs up, whatever it is. If you are listening on Spotify or YouTube, iTunes, or I guess it's Apple Podcast now. It's not iTunes anymore. Um, you can hopefully leave a review or follow us, whatever you do on all those platforms. We would really appreciate it. That's all for yeah. today, everyone. Any closing words, Mefta? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, both of you again, for having me. It, it, it has been a really great experience talking to you today. Yeah. All right. Up the pleasure there we go. We'll see you all later. And I think by the time that this actually goes out, it will be past Christmas. So happy new year, everyone. And happy we'll year. see you in the new year. Ciao.